I have noticed that I've been doing more IEM, DAC, and AMP reviews and fewer headphone videos. That is a sad realization. I like headphones, and I still have a wide selection that should be reviewed. I'll try to transition more of these headphone reviews into the process. And to celebrate this new promise that I have no idea I can faithfully keep, I want to talk about a headphone that few of you know about. This is the JVC HASW01. It's been around since at least 2015. You can still find these headphones brand new for $500 and JVC still sells them. They're essentially a collector's item, however, since these are mostly sold in Japan and in small quantities. Let's find out what this headphone has to offer. JVC is not known for their headphones. Speakers, amplifiers, camcorders, multipedia stuff, yes, that's well within JVC's typical product lineup. But headphones? Nah, not really. So, JVC, to stand apart from their competition, has a few tricks up their sleeves. The SW1 uses wood dome 40mm diaphragms. JVC says they use, quote, multiple layers of maple wood housing. This ostensibly includes wood rear board, baffle board, and a base bar. JVC says that the SW1 has a natural tone. Unfortunately, JVC offers little to no information about this headphone, and there are very few reviews of it online. From what I can gather, it appears that the SW1 was marketed for, quote, warm and natural sound signature. This headphone was featured on Drop in 2021, but clearly did not sell well. There were 36 requests and only 3 sold. I suppose in all the hype behind New Gear, it was hard to propel the SW1. The SW1 has a lot of metal, leather, and wood. The headband structure, including the yokes, are metal. Probably aluminum, I think. The ear cups are made of maple wood. This is nicely polished with minimal reflection. The ear cups swivel to lay flat and have sufficient horizontal and vertical movement for a secure fit. The ear pads are large and spacious. These are an over-ear design. The ear pads are cushioned with standard foam, but they are soft. The ear pads are easily replaceable and there's nothing proprietary about them. The headband is covered in leather and has plentiful foam padding. The SW1 comes with a dual 3.5mm cable. This is also not proprietary. There's no locking mechanism and the cable is not a peculiarly small design. You should be able to find alternative cables fairly easily. The cable that comes included is braided, soft, and pliable, but it's only about 4 feet long. The packaging also contains a soft pouch for storage. As for comfort, the SW1 is easy to wear for long periods. There's about average clamping force. It's about as much as the HD6XX and perhaps a little bit looser. The ear pads engulf my ears and there is good passive noise isolation. I can easily wear this headphone for about 3 hours before needing a break. Overall, the SW1 is built quite well. It's not necessarily a unique design overall, but it does still tend to stand out. The attention to detail is obvious. There are no rattling parts and everything seems to fit together really well. The accessories, however, are on the bare bones side. For $500, we don't get spare ear pads and the 4 foot cable is quite limiting. To test the SW1, I used it with various devices. This includes my RME ADI2 DAC, Cambridge Audio CXN V2 paired to my Gustard H16, and the Burson Conductor 3XR. I used the stock accessories and listened to my test playlist on Amazon Music HD and Cobus. The SW1 is fairly easy to drive. You can use a dongle DAC if you want, and that should provide plenty of power. Using insanely powerful amps like the Burson does not make any difference. I must emphasize that JVC recommends no more than 1.5 watts for this headphone. My tests indicate that the SW1 has elevated bass. In Mountains by Hans Zimmer, there's a rumble from the start of the song. This builds into a crescendo. The SW1 presented this detail clearly. Reverberation in transients was about average, similar to what I heard on the Allo S4X, except maybe just a tiny bit longer. The S4X had greater separation of sub-bass from mid-bass. When the crescendo hit, the organ cut through the other instruments. The rolling thunder effect was audible, slightly elevated, but did not drown out the other elements. When the vocals chimed in, they rose from the back until they were about shoulder to shoulder with the instruments. 
In Conquer by Overwork, there's a rolling marble sound at the beginning. This pans from right to left to center. The SW1 presented the sound of rolling marbles and the panning. There are multiple drums in this track, and the SW1 presented all of them clearly. However, each drum strike melded into the next. Drum impacts were hard, a little bit harder than what I heard on the S4X. I listened to several hip-hop songs, including Pure Water, New Patek, Reel It In, and Uproar. On each occasion, the SW1 recreated the sub-bass clearly. Subwoofers sounded like they were in the middle of a medium-sized room. Drums were a little louder than the subwoofer. Vocals were two steps ahead of the instruments and retained their sparkle. I listened to my Sicario playlist. I used these songs to listen for any audible bass distortion. Traversing from low to high volumes, I never heard distortion. Overall, the SW1 appears to have elevated bass. Both sub-bass and mid-bass appear to get this emphasis. This does not seem to be bloated, and it does not present a muddy rendition of the bass. In fact, there is still about average clarity in this region, though not as much as with the S4X. The SW1 seems to have slightly forward mids with marginally emphasized sibilance. In Orlok Artland's song, Why Am I Like This?, there's natural vocal gradient sibilance mixed in. The SW1 presented both, but marginally accentuated the latter. This sound is similar to what I heard on the Allo S4X, which also has a slight sibilance emphasis. The Avatone Planar was closer to neutral in this comparison. The drums and guitar melded with each other, slightly, but both instruments remained clear. Orlo's voice was one step ahead of the instruments. In Want You Back by Haim, the SW1 again showed that it marginally emphasizes female sibilance. This sound is similar to the S4X. At 8 seconds into the track, the primary singer says the word we and drags it out, making it sound gravelly. The SW1 rendered this detail clearly. There are two backup vocalists, one in either channel. The SW1 presented their tonalities in crystal clear fashion. When the instruments played at maximum, all three voices retained their separation, but I had to listen carefully to tell them apart. The drums, piano, guitar, and bass all tended to meld together, but none sounded veiled. In other words, no one instrument overpowered any other. In Superposition by Young the Giant, the SW1 presented the ukulele, drums, and bass, each instrument clear and separate from the others. The primary male vocalist was one step ahead of the instruments. His vocal sibilance was not emphasized and sounded similar to what I heard on the Aventone Planar. There's a backup vocalist in this track, his voice layered beneath the primaries. Most headphones cannot present this detail. The SW1 could not either. Between 1 minute and 10 and 1 minute and 20 seconds, there are sharp intakes of breaths. The SW1 presented this detail. Overall, the SW1 seems to have slightly forward mids. Vocals are 1 to 2 steps ahead of instruments. There is some bass bleed into the mids, but generally mid-centric elements are fairly clear. The SW1 slightly emphasizes female vocal sibilance. The SW1 seems to have a treble roll-off starting around the mid or upper treble region. In Skirts over X-Wings, the SW1 presented the brass and horns clearly. These instruments were separated from the other group sets. I could hear the nasally signatures of those instruments. However, their higher pitched notes seemed rolled off and slightly recessed compared to the Aventone Planar and the Allo S4X. The Timpani was audible on the SW1 and did not overpower the other elements. The SW1 seems to have depth and width, but no verticality. In other words, sounds come from further out into the wings or layered like an orchestra, but no sounds come from above or below. In Flight from the City, the SW1 made the piano sound like it was about 5 feet away. Its bassy notes were slightly emphasized, but not distorted. Transients was about average, resulting in some melding among their notes. I could hear the pops and sizzles and electric buzzing, but these elements were a little bit muffled. The cello was clear and melded with the piano. For the lack of a better term, the cello sounded smooth. I could just barely hear the creaking of wood on the pianist's bench and the shifting of the cello's weight. In Take 5 by the Dave Brubeck Quartet, the SW1 rendered the piano in the right, drums in the left, saxophone center, and bass one step behind. All instruments tended to meld a bit with each other, but no single element overpowered any other. The saxophone, again, sounded smooth. Its higher pitched notes seemed a little bit rolled off when compared to the Avantone Planar and the Allo S4X. The cymbals are struck at different positions, which should result in varying tonalities. The SW1 made all cymbal strikes sound the same. Overall, the SW1 appears to have a treble roll-off. I think this starts somewhere near the mid or upper treble region. 
I could not get the SW-1 to sound harsh on any recording even at high volumes. There's no better than average clarity in this region. JVC did not say anything about the headphone's sonic capabilities. This includes detail retrieval. I've had this headphone for about a year and used it with numerous devices and probably most genres known to man. I've never found the SW-1 to be anything close to a detail-oriented headphone. Obvious details will be audible, but subtle and nuanced details will either be difficult to hear or totally lost. It will depend on the particular recording. But if you were meant to hear something, the SW-1 will present that. Twangs of guitar strings, gravelly natures of voices, multiple vocalists, pops and sizzles, electric buzzing, creaking of wood, shifting of a cello's weight, these types of details are audible. However, some are more clear than others. For a more quantitative test, I used the song New Light by Kazuki. This track has layers of details including the sound of children playing, wind, rustling of grass, synth, piano, and footsteps. I count the number of steps I can hear in the first 60 seconds. The Sennheiser HD800S presents 22 footsteps. The Focal Clear presents 18. The Austrian Audio Hi X65 presents 16 to 17 footsteps. The Hi X55 presents 16. The Austrian Audio Hi X15 and X25BT present 13 to 14. The Hi Fi Man Sundara, Aventone Planar, Sipka Phoenix, and Bear Dynamic DT1990 all present 10 to 11. The Monolith M1070, M1570, Sipka Robin, and Ultrasound Pro 1480i all provide 8 to 9. The Odyssey LCD2 Close and LCD2 Classic each provides 7 to 8 footsteps. The older M1060C provides 7 footsteps. The Odyssey LCD-1 and the HD6XX present 6 to 7 footsteps. The Neumann NDH-20 presents 5 to 6 footsteps. The SW-1 rendered 7 to 8 footsteps. On my scale of detail retrieval, the HD6XX and LCD-1 are the average performers. Any headphone that provides more or less detail is judged accordingly. So the NDH-20 would be considered as below average and the Hi-Fi Masundara as above average. I think the SW-1 has above average detail retrieval. It's greater than that of the HD6XX and similar to what I hear on the LCD-2 Classic and the LCD-2 Closed. JVC does not give us any idea what type of soundstage we should expect from this headphone. Placement of the headphone on your head, the type of ear pads you use, whether the drivers receive sufficient power, and the original recording all play competing roles in your perception of soundstage. Here. The SW-1 never rendered a wide soundstage. Instead, I got the impression that it was average at best in this regard. The SW-1 does present width and depth, but no verticality. You will not hear a holographic or 3D soundscape. I have a soundstage scale. Once again, I use the HD6XX and LCD-1 as my average performers. Headphones that have more or less soundstage than these two are judged accordingly. The Odyssey Mobius and all Beats headphones have claustrophobic soundstage. The NDH20 and the ATH M60X have below average soundstage. The HD6XX and LCD1 have, obviously, average soundstage. The Sifka Phoenix, Emotiva GR1, and Ultrasound Pro 1480i have average to maybe above average soundstage, depending on the particular recording. The Hi Fi Man Sundara, Aventone Planar, Austrian Audio Hi X55 and X65, and the LCD2 Classic have above average soundstage. The Hi-Fi Man Diva has wide soundstage. The HD800S has super wide soundstage. In my opinion, the SW-1 has soundstage that is similar to that of the HD6XX and the LCD-1. If you use perforated ear pads, if you can find them, your experience might be different. I think it's a little comical that JVC still sells the SW-1 on its website, but has devoted little effort to marketing it. I mean. It's a $500 headphone that supposedly uses a unique driver. But try to find a review, look for frequency response graphs, and you'll be mystified. It's almost like nobody, including JVC, bothered to explain this headphone. Be that as it may, the SW-1 is a somewhat unique sound. It doesn't really fit a general sound signature. The SW-1 has elevated bass. Both sub-bass and mid-bass have an emphasis, but neither is bloated. The bass never distorts, and there's still average detail and separation of this region. There's some bass lead into the mids. The mids are slightly forward. Female vocals are marginally sibilant. 
Vocals stand one to two steps ahead of instruments. There's about average clarity and separation in the mids region. The treble sounds rolled off. This results in gentler treble instruments, including especially in the upper treble region. Play orchestral or jazz at high volumes, and you should not hear a piercing or harsh sound from this headphone. The SW1 has above average detail retrieval and average soundstage. This is what I call a dark sounding headphone. The rolled off treble, slightly emphasized bass, and intimate presentation are the hallmarks I listen for in this type of situation. The scant marketing would have us believe that the SW1 has a natural sound. Well, I never heard anything unnatural if that makes a difference. The SW1 has an intimate, warm, dark sound signature. It's not V-shaped or balanced or even neutral. We should do an A-B comparisons with all gear. That's the only way we can figure out if we need to return a product. After all, with all the marketing nonsense and endless hype, we need to be smarter with our money. Here, we will compare the SW1 against the Odyssey LCD2 Closed, Denon D5200, and the Sony MDR-Z7 Mark II. I used stock accessories for all headphones. I plugged each headphone into a passive AB switch. That switch was connected to my RME ADI2 DAC. I listened to my test playlist on Amazon Music HD and Kobuz. I tried to volume match. The LCD2 has less sub-bass presence than the SW1. Bass transients is noticeably faster on the LCD2. Separation of sub-bass from mid-bass is also more obvious on the LCD2. Mid-bass impact is harder on the SW1. The mids are different. The LCD2 has vocals that are more forward, more sibilant than that of the SW1. The LCD2 also emphasizes vocal grain. The LCD2 has greater separation among mid-centric elements. Vocals sound more intimate on the SW1. There's greater bass bleed into the mids on the SW1. The treble on the LCD2 has an emphasis compared to the SW1. Since the SW1 has an upper treble roll-off, that's not really surprising. The LCD2 has greater separation of all treble instruments, while the SW1 places them closer together and also closer to the ears. The LCD2 has wider soundstage, but about as much detail retrieval as the SW1. However, the LCD2 always presented the details a little bit more clearly. The D5200 appears to have very similar sub-bass rendition compared to the SW1. However, it seemed that the transients was marginally, very slightly, faster on the 5200. Separation of sub-bass from mid-bass was clearer on the 5200. Mid-bass impact was hard to distinguish and it sounded pretty much the same to me. The mids, however, are noticeably different. Both headphones cater to vocals, separating them and placing them ahead of instruments. However, the 5200 has more sibilance and vocal grain emphasis than the SW1. There's more obvious separation among all mid-centric elements on the 5200. The SW1 made vocals sound closer to the ears. The treble was similar between these headphones. Going back and forth, it sounded like the upper treble was similarly rolled off. However, I also heard a marginal emphasis somewhere in the mid-treble region on the 5200. I could not hear this type of emphasis on the SW1. Placement of treble instruments was similar, though the 5200 had a bit more clarity. The 5200 has wider soundstage, but very similar detail retrieval. The Z7 has less sub-bass emphasis than the SW1. Transits, however, appears to be the same. Separation of sub-bass from mid-bass is marginally clearer on the Z7. Bass clarity is by minor accounts more obvious on the Z7. Mid-bass impact is about the same. The mids are different. The Z7 has more separation among mid-centric elements. Vocals are marginally less sibilant on the Z7, and I think closer to neutral in this regard. Neither headphone emphasizes vocal grain. The SW1 presents vocal closer to the ears. There is greater bass bleed into the mids on the SW1. Both headphones appear to have similar treble rendition. Both have a marginal roll-off in the upper treble area, or thereabouts. However, I always got the impression that the SW1's roll-off was not quite as much as that of the Z7. Perhaps this was due to imperfect volume matching. Separation of treble instruments is a little bit clearer on the Z7. The Z7 has wider soundstage, but the SW1 has greater detail retrieval. In my new light test, the Z7 rendered 6 to 7 footsteps compared to the SW1's 7 to 8. Comparisons like these help us understand where products fit in. Here, it is obvious that none of these headphones sound identical. Perhaps one or none of these headphones might be to your liking. But at least you have plenty of options in the market. 
there are so many headphones in the market that you could easily find something that works for you. Odyssey, Sennheiser, Bayer Dynamic, and Audio-Technica seem to get the bulk of the attention. Some of these companies spend an inordinate amount of money on advertising, while others just rely upon word of mouth. Then there's Sony, Fostex, KLH, NAD, and others that don't even bother with pushing their products. You might find their stuff in print magazines, but unless you specifically search for headphones from these companies, you might never be led to research their offerings. JVC, I think, falls in line with the likes of Sony and Fostex, at least in this regard. Little to no marketing, resulting in minimal attention from the audiophile community. The HASW1 has some uniqueness to it. You get a standard headphone design with a bit of flair, though nothing ostentatious. And instead of using typical drivers, JVC opted for wood dome. That's a bit like Ultrasound using their vaunted S-Logic drivers. The SW1 has a warm, dark sound signature. You'll get elevated bass, forward mids, and a rolled off gentler treble. This headphone has above average detail, but average soundstage. It's comfortable, well built, and comes with fairly good accessories, though they are quite limited. In the pantheon of headphones, it's just too bad that JVC could not get more attention for the SW1. I am a proponent of having meaningful choices in the market, and the SW1 seems to fit that desire. But is it value at $500? When I think about this headphone and what significant shortcomings it has, I reach a blank. I mean, yes, I truly wish these pricey headphones would come with more meaningful accessories, but unless the audiophile community as a cohesive entity demands that from companies, it simply won't happen. Other than the lack of premium accessories, the SW1 simply checks all the necessary marks. It's got a unique sound signature, a very unique driver design, it's comfortable, and it has good construction. When you compare this headphone against the Z7 Mark II, D5200, and the LCD2 Closed, you notice it's in the same price ballpark. Except for the LCD2, which of course costs nearly double. But that's Odyssey for you. I also considered other alternatives lower down the price ladder. But I could not think of any other headphones that sounds like the SW1. Sure, you have the HD6XX, Philips X2, and SHP9500, and the Meze 99 Classics, but what else is there that has a warm sound signature at least below $500? The thing with the SW1 is that it's not just a warm sounding headphone. It has a dark sound signature. Taken in totality, I have to say that the SW1 is value. Like any headphone or IEM, your preferred sound signature will dictate whether this is a product you might like and I can't make that judgment for you. What I can say is that if you choose to buy the SW1, you get something that's unique. And if you're tired of the Hi-Fi Man, Odyssey, Sennheiser, and Bear Dynamic hype trains, then maybe take a look at the lesser known brands like JVC. You might be surprised. <laughs>